are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. It's time for another update on Ukraine and, uh, and a perspective on Ukraine. I always look forward to speaking to my next guest, who is knowledgeable and sane on the topic. Anatole Levin is the director of the Eurasia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He is the author of the book, Ukraine and Russia, A Fraternal Rivalry. Uh, he was in Ukraine uh, in March, uh, and he's been uh, doing a lot of very interesting writing and speaking on the topic. Uh, so with that, well, excuse me, without any further ado, uh, Anatole Levin, welcome back to the Zero Hour. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you. And I wanted to start with this. I was sorry to hear that while you were in Ukraine, you had an accident and were hospitalized for a week. So first of all, I hope you're recovering. Yes, yes, getting much better, thanks. I'm glad to hear it. And um, I also, you wrote an interesting piece uh, on uh, spending a week in the in the hospital. Uh, and um, one of the interesting observations you made is that while there was, I think there was aerial bombardment going on, but you said you weren't afraid largely because the staff of the hospital wasn't afraid. Do I have that right? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I, I noticed that immediately. I was carried in that they hadn't um, you know, taped up the windows, which is the first thing you do if you think that bombs or rockets are liable to land nearby because um, so much of the damage is done by flying glass. And so I thought either they must be remarkably careless uh, or they're not seriously worried. And in fact, I mean, in the uh, nine days in all that I spent in, in Zaporizhia, you know, counting the time out of the hospital, uh, only one person was killed uh, and 30 injured. That was on the last day. Now, on other occasions, there have been more casualties. Uh, but uh, I was very struck by how extremely ineffective the Russian air campaign is. And um, that seems to be a, a mixture of things. Uh, the Russian missiles are very inaccurate. Hmm. Uh, they are using um, anti-aircraft missiles in a ground bombardment role, uh, probably in order to try to use up um, the, the Ukrainian air defenses. But I see. I mean, as a result, they can't hit what they're aiming at. And as long as the Ukrainian um, air defense missiles last, I mean, that could be a problem, as the Pentagon leak suggests. Um, the Ukrainians have become very good at, at shooting down Russian missiles. So yes, I mean, the, the Russian air campaign is not succeeding. It, it also makes it difficult sometimes to tell, you know, when the Russians are deliberately uh, attacking purely civilian targets and when they're either missing or being shot down. And this is causing what, of course, if it were the US armed forces would be called collateral damage. Right. And, you know, uh, I, th I believe that city has a population of about 700,000. <laughs> so certainly while there have been more casualties, uh, one death is, is, every death is important, but you know, not statistically significant in that sense. So, um, so that the impression I get is the terrible destruction we've seen in photographs and so on probably has more to do with battles between ground forces or attacks by ground forces, ground-based missiles, that sort of, and weaponry, that sort of thing, right? Yes. I mean, I wasn't allowed to go to the front line. You need special permission, which I didn't get. Uh, but undoubtedly, I mean, if you look at the pictures from Bakhmut or from Mariupol, they are very like what I saw in Grozny myself in, in the Chechen War of 94 to 96. But yes, I mean, these are places where ground battles and artillery duels have lasted for, for weeks or, or months. I mean, when I visited the towns north of Kiev that were uh, where fighting took place at the start of the war. Um, they have not been damaged on the scale of, of Bakhmut, but certainly there was a great a great deal more damage than I saw in Zaporizhia or Dnipro or, or Kiev. Now, when you were there, who, who did you meet with uh, when you were obviously the hospital uh, the accident altered your schedule significantly? Uh, but um, who did you meet with? What did you see? 
uh, you know, what kind of information were you gathering? Uh, I was tr trying to talk to politicians, obviously, uh, journalists, military veterans, including wounded military veterans, uh, medical staff, and uh, just ordinary people. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, who, really, uh, whoever I could meet. And the interesting thing about the hospital, of course, was that uh, it was an opportunity to have long, you know, informal conversations uh, with ordinary nurses, cleaning staff, fellow patients. And north of Kiev, I, I of course, I talked to um, local officials and military veterans, uh, but I also made a point of talking to as many people as I could catch on the street and, you know, while visiting cemeteries uh, in, in order to get, um, you know, some independent evidence of the uh, atrocities which the Russian army committed there uh, at the start of the war. And do you, uh, did the trip, uh, you know, you've been studying the area for a long time, you've been studying the conflict since it began last year. Did the trip alter your perceptions of the situation in any significant way? To some extent. Now, once again, you know, I, I, I can't comment on the actual battlefield because I wasn't allowed. So there I, I only know, you know, what I heard um, from military veterans. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that anything was transformational, but there were certainly interesting aspects to it. I mean, one obviously was um, the, the limited damage uh, done to most Ukrainian cities and um, the extent to which, you know, normal life was just proceeding. Mm. Uh, I was struck, I must say, by the extent to which the elites in Kiev are still living uh, very much the high life. If you look at luxury mm. restaurants, um, food shops, uh, I went off to the um, uh, the ballet in in Kiev. I spent a very pleasant evening at the ballet. It was absolutely packed, and we got mm. the, the last tickets. Um, and uh, so that was one thing. And the the evidence, which I suppose it didn't come uh, as a particular surprise to me after what, what I'd seen in the nineteen nineties. Uh, but the sheer inaccuracy of Russian weaponry was very striking because you could visit places where it was absolutely obvious that they were aiming uh, at one thing. For example, the headquarters of the Ukrainian Security Service in Dnipro, uh, in in uh, in Kiev too, by the way, and they'd missed, um, and they'd hit the road nearby, or in the mm -hmm. case of Dnipro, they'd they'd shattered a, a row of shops opposite, um, but missed the. The, the security headquarters. So that was striking. Um, the talking to uh, military veterans about the, um, the, the battlefield, uh, w one of the things that, that struck me was how they all talked about mines as a tremendously important factor. Now we've mm. heard about that, but um, well, partly because I, I saw so, so many poor devils, you know, without legs. Right. Uh, but they very much talked about how, um, you know, Ukrainian use of mines had uh, slowed up or halted Russian attacks um, and how, you know, Russians would run into minefields and then basically stop and go back. Uh, but uh, of course, in this forthcoming uh, promised Ukrainian offensive, that could also work uh, against, you know, against the Ukrainians, because undoubtedly Russia also has a huge number of mines, the and is using them. Um, the a couple of other things. One was, um, I, I mean, I, I found nobody in Ukraine. I mean, if they did, they probably wouldn't have talked to me, but um, there was no evidence in the Russian speaking cities that I visited uh, of any support for the Russian invasion or sympathy for Putin, you know, or, or desire to come under Russian rule, none. Um, strong, strong hostility to um to the kremlin and the russian armed forces and and excuse me for interrupting anatole but 
this was one of the things that I found especially striking about your your uh, recent writing uh, regarding Ukraine, because you mentioned that, uh, I believe, in your interviews as well as your writing. And I thought that was important. And it struck me because, you know, my understanding has been that uh, perhaps before the war anyway, that the, there was tension between the Ukrainian speaking majority and uh, and the Russian speaking areas and that to a certain extent Russia and of course this is all uh, not based on any kind of primary sources on my part but my impression that the Russian speaking parts of Ukraine felt depressed in some way that they felt their use of language their culture was being discouraged by the government and uh, you know so among other things when the war began i thought well perhaps there's a way out of it russia's occupied crimea for some time for example maybe there's a way out of this that uh, in which uh, referenda are held and and these uh, the you know the russian speaking uh, majority russian speaking areas may choose to join russia and so on and one of the real shifts in my perception and i hadn't really kept up to date with it i had no data sources to do that but one of the real shifts in my perception uh, tracking your uh reporting from this area is that it seems to me uh and it may be positive a uh, positive development and all but it seems to me that that's not the case at all that in fact if anything first of all i don't know that my perception was right about this alienation on the part of the russian speaking population but if it were right it seems to me that it's been uh, superseded by a, a strong sense of loyalty to the nation of Ukraine. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, I think that's that's absolutely right. And uh, of course, I can't say what people th thought when the invasion happened. Uh, but, you know, in Zaporizhia or Dnipro, even if the Russian bombardment, you know, has not been very effective, uh, a year of being, you know, bombarded, uh, will do that. Um, it doesn't leave you with much affection for the other side. Uh, right. And um, so, yes, I mean, undoubtedly, the invasion has, has consolidated uh, the loyalty um, of the Russian speakers. And when you say Russian speakers, you're, you're also, I mean, what struck me so much in, in Zaporizhia was that, I mean, literally, I mean, just about everybody I talked to, maybe with one exception, uh, was not um, partly Russian by blood, you know, with a Russian mother or father or grandmother, sometimes completely Russian, often, you know, originally from Russia itself, very, very often with close relatives working in Russia, uh, either because they, the family had come from Russia originally or because they had moved to Russia in recent years to work because Russian living standards were so much higher. Now, the only thing is, though, that when you say loyalty to the Ukrainian state, that's absolutely true. There is still, however, a certain question which could become important in future, uh, which is what kind of Ukrainian state? Mm. Because uh, you know, Zelensky was elected president uh, very much on the vote of the Russian-speaking east and south of the country. Now. Uh, since the war, and he, Zelensky previously always stood for the idea of a multi-ethnic, multilingual mm -hmm. Ukraine. Since the war, he has more or less uh, adopted the all the, the language and attitudes of Ukrainian ethnic and ethno-linguistic nationalists. And one thing that struck me was that, you know, in in Kiev, and I mean, you know, very understandably north of Kiev, in the towns that were occupied by Russia, the, the, the hatred is not just of the Russian government, Putin, and the Russian armed forces, but you get a lot of a very hate-filled language, um, uh, in fact, often racist language about the Russians, the Russian people as a whole, and the whole Russian cultural tradition as basically representing mongoloid savagery, which I heard again and again, or hmm. read, um, you know, Asiatic barbarism. Uh, now that, of course, you do not hear nearly so much in an area where so many people are uh, largely Russian themselves by blood. 
Um, and uh, certainly you don't hear in Zaporizhia, you know, attacks on Russian culture of that kind. There, the hostility is to Putin, the Russian government, the Russian armed forces. That, you know, is, is, could, could be a significant difference in future uh, after the war. But as long as the war lasts, of course, this, this creates a, um, you know, well, consolidation of the Ukrainian population. So there could be ethnic tensions exacerbated, uh, you know, after the war is over. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things, well, first of all, I have to say, just as a comment, excuse me, I have to say just as a comment that it seems to me that uh, Russia's made a number of tactical errors here, but it seems to me one of them is the constant bombardment of a popular Russia, largely Russian speaking population. It seems to me that even if the most cynical calculation uh, on Russia's part would say we might not want to consolidate civilian hatred of us by bombing these, you know, what they might view as potentially sympathetic uh, groups of Ukrainians to the point of utter hostility. So I wonder if there isn't this shabby, and again, I'm not I'm not saying this because I support the ethics of the invasion, but just uh, uh, thinking tactically among the tactical errors they seem to have made. I wonder if that just wasn't foolish of them. Yep, as Metternich said, worse than a crime of blunder. Um, but I, I mean, the, the Russian government has made, I mean, uh, quite apart from the criminality of the invasion um, and the, you know, at best, the indifference to civilian casualties. Uh, yes, I mean, the Russian government has made one disastrously stupid error after another, um, beginning with the belief that the large part of the, Russia, of the Ukrainian population would rally to Russia's side or accept Russian rule. And then, of course, one strategic mistake after another. And I mean, as I said in one article, if the Russian high command seriously thinks that they can either win hearts and minds or, on the other hand, terrify a, a population into submission by very limited aerial bombing, well, they must be even stupider than we thought they were. Because, you know, if you look at the, the history of Britain, or for that matter of Germany during the Second World War, you know, we know that vastly greater levels of uh, bombardment of cities uh, actually strengthens the popular will to resist. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't weaken it. Uh, but you know, the the, the perception that the, the the Russian government and military are headed by brutal incompetence, you know, is some. Um, I don't think will come as a surprise to any listener. No, I don't think so. And uh, and I wanted to get back to this exacerbation of um, of uh, ethnic tension too, because I mean, one of the things we hear sometimes in discussion, um, mostly on the left and right in this country, not so much in this sort of broad center, is a discussion of things like the Azov Battalion and other, you know, just you know. Uh, described, uh, you know, a neo-Nazi kind of, uh, you know, far-right nas ethnic nationalist groups being incorporated into the military effort, being uh, turned into battalions of the Ukrainian military, uh, and, and there's a sense that uh, among some people uh, that this represents a kind of undercurrent, a growing undercurrent of fascism or a fascist strain in uh in ukrainian civil society and uh potentially in the government as well and you know i have no opinion on that frankly i don't know enough but i know it's been brought up multiple times and there's concern about you know, azov battalion using nazi insignia or whatever it is i've heard this talk i don't as i say i don't not knowledgeable enough to draw any conclusions about it but i wonder if that's a factor that's real and it could potentially be a problem in a post-war ukraine well i mean the, the political support for the uh, azov and its associated um political party uh, has always been very limited 
They have, however, gained a lot of additional prestige uh, as a result of their genuine heroism during the war. I met one of their officers. He was a very impressive guy, especially the defense of Mariupol. Um, now, my sense is, you see, that perhaps some of the, the harder edges of their uh, extreme ethnic uh, nationalism, not to put it more strongly, uh, may, uh, when it comes to, you know, internally in Ukraine, may have been rubbed off, um, you know, as a result of the, 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 the loyalty of the Russian-speaking population to the Ukrainian fight. On the other hand, um, language uh, about Russia and Russians, which was only characteristic before the war uh, of the most extreme rightist groups, uh, is now um, you know, universal and, and used by government advisors since the, the invasion began. Um, but I, I think a wider problem, not specific to Azov, is that you know people have said explicitly that if Zelensky were to try to negotiate a ceasefire mm -hmm. or compromise peace with Russia, uh, he would commit he would commit political suicide. Um, there have been you know strong indications that uh, yes, I mean well back last March when when Zelensky did try to negotiate that there were open statements from uh, sections of the Ukrainian political elites warning him you know that he was in danger of being overthrown. Uh, and what I think we may certainly see uh, after the war or even during the war is a much, much greater political role for the Ukrainian armed forces, mm. especially in two contexts. One is if indeed there is uh, a move towards a, uh, a ceasefire, because the population as a whole, while a majority are in favor of fighting on to total victory, there's certainly a significant minority who would accept a uh, a ceasefire at least, you know, which would leave some territory in Russian hands. Nobody I talked to from the military was willing to accept that. They, they are determined mm -hmm. on total victory and the you know, recovery of Crimea and the Eastern Donbass. The other thing though, and this is why I mentioned, you know, the, um, the, the, the luxurious life of the Kiev elites, uh, is that you know, there have been serious concerns about corruption in Ukraine. And Zelensky, you know, under American pressure, uh, has tried, you know, had made some at least you know, important symbolic steps against that. But one could well imagine, you know, soldiers coming back, um, their friends and comrades have been killed. Mm -hmm. uh, they are expected to go back, you know, to their previous pretty impoverished lifestyle. Uh, and they see people um, about whom there are, you know, serious questions, shall we say, where the money came from, and how, uh, <laughs> who are still living, you know, a life of champagne in Kiev. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing which, um, uh, well, very understandably, really, really annoys soldiers, uh, and can, you know, lead to serious problems for electoral democracy. Right. A large number of annoyed or angry soldiers plus an alienated military leadership is not healthy for the survival of democracy, one might say, right? Um, and I wanted to talk a bit more. Well, first of all, before we get to this concept of total victory, was there anything in the, you know, we had the Discord leaks recently uh, of classified information. Was there anything in those that changed your understand? I mean, one of the takeaways I got from it is that uh, the US government has been adopting a much more optimistic public line towards uh, Ukraine's prospects against Russia than it has uh, assessed privately. And um, was there anything in there that changed your perception of the on the ground situation in Ukraine? 
Uh, well, I mean, so something uh, that uh, obviously made me wonder whether the Russian air campaign will go on being so ineffective uh, was the, the the leak that Ukraine is running out of anti-aircraft missiles. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the US can compensate to some extent with Stingers and Patriots, but most of the missiles that the Ukrainians w were using, including in Zaporizhia when I was there, uh, were Soviet S-300s, which are, and other Soviet era weaponry, very effective, by the way, uh, but um, apparently they are running out. And that could, uh, well, if not transform the campaign against the cities, uh, it could, could uh, transform the situation on the battlefield because the um, one of the, the really striking things about this war, which really surprised military observers, uh, was that the Russian Air Force uh, and ground attack aircraft and helicopters have been so very ineffective. And the key reason for that is successful Ukrainian anti-aircraft fire. But that could be... So, so, yeah, so that could be a huge shift. Uh, you know, I think in our last conversation, Anatole, it was, uh, you know, it was hard to imagine a way out uh, of this situation without you know, a protracted period of war. If you now, if you have a military leadership that believes it can achieve total victory, I'm not aware of any intelligence assessment or any other assessment uh, that suggests that, uh, you know, if a total victory is driving the Russian army back to the pre-2014 borders getting crimea back it, 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 that may be a desirable outcome but it, it, you know there's russian interests in having a port and so on uh is that possible is that what they envision is it achievable or is it a situation where they're locked in an unachievable goal on the ukrainian side and putin seems to be a russia uh, seems to be locked into an unachievable goal on its side well, you know, I, I wouldn't absolutely rule anything out because, you know, the, the, the Ukrainian um, armed forces have surprised us again and again with their successes. Uh, so I wouldn't, I certainly would not rule out the possibility of a, of a Ukrainian victory. But of course, you know, I, one can't also rule out the possibility that the Ukrainians will exhaust themselves and their ammunition supplies use up their manpower. Uh, and then Russia will be in a position uh, to launch a, a new successful offensive of its own. Um, I don't think myself that whatever happens, a formal peace settlement is possible because the position of, of the two sides is just much, much too far apart. I, I can imagine um, eventually through sheer exhaustion, uh, a ceasefire. and. I mean, a question there is, you know, would the, the Ukraine, the Ukrainians really fear that because they, they fear that as in Cyprus or, or Kashmir, uh, a temporary ceasefire will become a permanent partition. Uh, the question is whether Putin and the Russian government uh, would accept that, would basically accept being able to hang on to the territory that it has. Uh, I heard, but of course, on the other hand, Russia hasn't got all the territory that it's claimed. Because right. I, heard, um, I, I heard back last summer, uh, after all the, um, you know, the huge casualties that Russia has taken, and Ukraine, by the way, I mean, I, you know, I visited military cemeteries, and I, I can't put an exact figure on it, but undoubtedly the Ukrainian casualties have been huge as well. Uh, but I heard from informants in Moscow, uh, of course, now they, they're passing on third-hand information, but that there was a possibility that if um, Russia could conquer the whole of the Donbass, not just the eastern part, that Putin might then use this to declare victory, um, claim that he'd won, and offer a ceasefire. But of course, to, to the amazement, I think, of everybody, um, Russia hasn't even managed to capture the whole of the Donbass. It's been battering away at Bakhmut, you know, a very small city. Nobody had heard of it uh, before the war for almost six months now without success. Um, 
so I mean, on the one hand, it, it's still difficult for Putin really to declare victory with any you know appearance of truth but on the other hand you know R russia russian forces and especially its elite troops are really seriously depleted so i can imagine in the end uh, as i say a ceasefire of mutual exhaustion if neither side succeeds in breaking through we'll have a much clearer idea i think by the maybe the late autumn or winter <laughs> One of the things I always, uh, you know, I, I'm just perennially trying to figure a way out of uh, seemingly insoluble situations, which is, you know, a, a frustrating thing to do a lot of the time. But, but one of the things I mentioned to you, I think, in a note, uh, Senator George Aiken famously during the Vietnam War said, uh, and I, I thought a widely misunderstood quote, but he said, oh, you know, in effect, paraphrasing, why don't we just declare a victory and get out? Meaning, uh, you know, people parodied it and thought it was absurd. But actually what he was saying, you know, was more politically sophisticated than that. I think what he was saying was, we're never going to, this is, a, in effect, this is, we're fighting a, an entire population. We can never win that war, but we can declare face saving terms for ourselves and bring it to an end. And uh, I'm wondering to a certain extent whether, for example, there is a way to offer Putin an out if, for example, you know, even if you lose, continue to lose on the battlefield of saying, look, uh, in place of you, uh, Ukraine joining NATO, maybe we'll have a mutual something pact between NATO and Ukraine, but not official membership. Putin can say he's achieved, protected his border, and not because I like Putin or want to make his life more comfortable, but as a way to end the conflict. Is there something like that of offering uh, something to Putin so that the killing and the dying stops? I, I as I say, I can imagine a ceasefire with Putin. I can't actually imagine a peace settlement. But a ceasefire, you know, as as I mentioned, Cyprus, um, uh, one could also talk about Ireland, actually, between the 1920s and the 1960s. Uh, but um, I, I, I don't think that either Putin or any Russian government can withdraw from Crimea uh, because mm. it is too strategically important. But also, you see, uh, I mean, one thing that struck me was that nobody I talked to in Ukraine uh, had any kind of plan for how to reintegrate the population of Crimea, mm. which by all accounts is, you know, largely pro-Russian, uh, or the Eastern Donbass, which one should remember, uh, you know, I, I talked about bombardment, Russian bombardment consolidating loyalty to Ukraine. Well, the Ukrainians have been bombarding the Eastern Donbass since 2014. Yeah. That has also not built sympathy, apparently, for Ukraine there, you know, obviously. But um, one man, a, a senior advisor to Zelensky called um, Mikhail Podolyak, uh, he said uh, very candidly, you can read the interview, um, it was translated into English, it was quoted on Radio Liberty, uh, to hell with all these ideas of, of um, you know, trying to reconcile the population of Crimea. Uh, we must um, ba basically uh, purge, arrest uh, anyone who has collaborated with the Russians. And uh, the re for the rest, anyone who wants to go on speaking Russian and, you know, is loyal to Russia must leave. Well, I mean, that would be a, you know, I mean, this is not quite like America leaving Vietnam. This is a little bit more like America leaving Texas. Right, right. Which has been proposed, by the way. But the, well, the, um, the uh, or a little bit like, I, I mean, I sort of envisioned the partition of India too a little bit there. I mean, you're talking about mass, forcing mass migration. But the ceasefire and, 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 and is... You know, you mentioned Ireland, for example. Well, the Irish Republicans fought a bitter civil war over de Valera's willingness to accept this sort of ceasefire partition. So it sounds like even a ceasefire would be a tough 
uh, if it left in place the division of Ukraine uh, could lead to enormous tension within the country of Ukraine too, right? Well, absolutely. And I mean, that is why I think that, you know, only, uh, um, you know, really strong US support for a ceasefire uh, could, uh, could, could allow it to happen. Because uh, I have the sense that you know, the only way that Zelensky could possibly agree to one, I mean, unless the Russian army was sweeping forward to such an extent that he had no military choice um, would be if he could claim to his own hardliners and the military that America had basically forced him into a ceasefire uh, because I mean obviously the you know even the most hardline Ukrainians are, are not going to uh, openly uh, oppose the, the United States given you know how critical US aid is to, to, to Ukraine um, but, but that, of course, would require great moral courage on the part of a U.S. administration. Right. Though, I mean, the other thing is that, um, you know, the Ukrainians are nervous, obviously, about the U.S. presidential elections next year. Um, they dread, as you can imagine, the idea of, of, of Trump being reelected. Uh, but some of them do also understand that you know if god forbid america gets involved in a war with china or really you know fo starts focusing all its attention on china then you know this level of support for ukraine is simply not guaranteed in right. the future uh, but these are you know i would say a small minority of um you, you know ukrainians with a real grasp of of international uh, affairs it's it's not true of most of the people i talked to well, Anatoly, even we didn't solve it this time either, but uh, yeah, but um, that's not to be expected. But thank you so much for this extremely informative update. Again, Anatoly Levin is director of the Eurasia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, which can be found at quincyinst.org. And he is the author of the book, Ukraine and Russia, the Fraternal Rivalry. Again, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Till soon, I hope. No, I hope. Uh, and we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.